Every once in a while, a Pokemon is added to the game which changes the game forever. Like, the existence of this Pokemon feels like a canon event. That pivotal decision to create the Pokemon has had a larger influence on the future of the game than Plusle and Minum will ever have. Throughout the history of the game, there's a number of Pokemon that are like this, all of which deserve a video, but today we'll be discussing the Treasures of Ruin. These four Dark-type legendary Pokemon have such powerful and useful abilities that them being released into competitive play alone was enough to justify a whole new regulation of metagame to develop around them. Literally, what's the difference between Regulation B and Regulation C? Four Pokemon. Chi Yu, Qian Pao, Wo Qian, Hi Bestie, and Ting Lu. What makes them so powerful? Well, that's what we'll be discussing in today's video. If you enjoyed this video and I'm playing time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. As a matter of fact, you should really just subscribe right now because I have a playlist full of content just like this that you can watch once this video ends. And if you think you're subscribed, do me a favor and double check because only like half of my viewers actually are. With that, let's get into the video. I'm a little sick, so I might sound off in this video. Okay, just, just throw that at the beginning. Let's go. <laughs> With the release of Generation 9, we were introduced to a whole new batch of Pokemon, including the regular old batch of regional Pokemon, the Box Legends, Paradox Pokemon, and of course, the Treasures of Ruin. I know what you're thinking right now. These are the hardest Pokemon designs of all time. I mean, that's a Snow Leopard with swords for fangs, that's a Moose with a bowl on its head, that's a Goldfish with beads for eyes, and that's a Snail made out of leaves. And pieces of wood. 10 out of 10, no notes. The lore goes hard too, but that's besides the point. The only thing harder than these things' designs are their abilities. Look, a Pokemon's type, stats, and move pool can really decide what power level they're working with. But these things' abilities are what's really carrying them, as they effectively make all of them better at their jobs than their stats would lead you to believe. Each one of these guys has an ability of Ruin, which ruins the stats of everything on the board that doesn't have that specific ability. Chi Yu's Beads of Ruin lowers everything's special defense by 25%, Shen Pao's Sword of Ruin lowers everything's physical defense by 25%, Ting Lu's Vessel of Ruin lowers everything's special attack by 25%, and Wo Chen's Tablets of Ruin lowers everything's attack stat by 25%. So, Chi Yu and Chen Pao will effectively make everything hit harder by making everything on the field a lot squishier, and Ting Lu and Wo Chen will effectively make everything bulkier by making everything on the field not hit quite as hard. Oh, and fun fact, if all four of these Pokemon are on the field at the same time, nothing happens. That's how math works. Now, Pokemon has always had a very visible power creep issue. Most Gen 1 Pokemon aren't really cutting it nowadays, and while I'd like to believe that Game Freak is conscious of this happening, they aren't really creating Pokemon in a way that makes me believe that they care. Look, they made a Gen 2 Pokemon in Gen 9, it's, it's named Spidops, but making a bunch of weaker Pokemon doesn't mean much when you release two Pokemon, which are effectively AoE PEDs. Yes, each one of these Pokemon are strong because they effectively buff their own stats, but really everything on the field is getting buffed, or nerfed, it's a matter of perspective. Point is, these guys are mostly used to make their partner stronger. Believe me, Fluttermane was already insane, but in Regulation C, when Fluttermane was able to be put next to Chi Yu, it became a whole new level of broken. Fluttermane was able to run the booster energy item to increase its speed stat and either launch its own nuke with Terra Fairy Moonblast with Beads of Ruin active, or Icy Wind to make the opposing Pokemon slower than Chi Yu and letting Chi Yu launch the nuke instead. Or you could reverse the roles and have Scarf Chi Yu with the Specs Fluttermane. Or a Sash Chi Yu with the Specs Fluttermane. It didn't really matter, you could put either item on either Pokemon and it would work. They even complemented each other type-wise. Chi Yu could easily melt the steel types which would check Fluttermane, and Fluttermane could be immune to the fighting types that would otherwise one-shot Chi Yu. This pair of Pokemon were able to dominate Regulation C tournaments due to their great synergy, and despite their low bulk, they were able to succeed since they sped up the pace of the match to the point where most Pokemon would get one shot before they could even return the favor. Like, there's no need to tank a hit when the other Pokemon doesn't even get to attack. But Chi Yu didn't just pair well with Fluttermane, any special attacker heavily benefited from its existence in the field, from Golden Go to Earth Luna Blood Moon and even Calyrex Shadow Rider in restricted formats. Chi Yu was able to make Hyper Offense the name of the game for the format for a while, and Chen Pao was right on its heels doing the same thing for physical attackers. Chen Pao as a Dark Ice type already has incredible offensive stabs. With 135 base speed and 120 attack, it's able to outspeed things and hit like a truck due to Sword of Ruin. But once again, it's less about what it does on its own and more about what it enables. When Chen Pao first dropped, its strongest partner was without a doubt Dragonite, one of the few Gen 1 Pokemon who were still able to keep up with the Gen 9 threats. This is mostly due to its ability Inner Focus. While originally Inner Focus was a pretty mid-tier ability granting a simple immunity to flinching, in Generation 8, it was buffed to grant the user immunity to Intimidate as well, meaning that dealing with this thing's great 134 attack set wasn't as simple as switching in an Arcanine, Landorus, or Incineroar. You actually have to manually lower that stat. 
Players soon found that slapping a choice span and terrestrializing this thing into a normal type, the spam extreme speed next to Chen Pao produced, frankly, offensively good results. And I don't mean like it's good offensively, I mean it's it, it's offensively good, like a Pokemon shouldn't be doing this much damage with a neutral attack. And extreme speed is 100% the strongest priority move in the game. 80 base power is already arguably too strong for a priority move, but this isn't just any priority move, it's got plus 2 priority, meaning it can bypass even follow me if the user's faster. Pao Knight became one of the best duos for teams that just need to bust holes in things. And Chen Pao had a number of other phenomenal partners throughout Generation 9. Iron Hands would typically not invest much in its attack stat since it really needed that special defense to make sure it wouldn't fall to a single Moonblast. For this reason, it hit for great but still reasonable amounts of damage. This changes once Chen Pao hits the field because Chen Pao's Sword of Ruin effectively grants Iron Hands a life orb boost, allowing for it to hit for way too much damage and recovering tons of health with Drain Punch, a move which is usually a pretty reasonable amount of damage. I actually remember the first time I ran this duo in a tournament myself at Peoria Regionals thinking, oh, why haven't I done this yet? Why have I been making life so hard on myself? I can just use the broken moves. A similar feeling swept over me when I first tried out Urshifu Rapid Strike with Chen Pao. Urshifu is probably the current strongest one of Chen Pao's partners, as not only does it complement it by checking the fire and steel types which threaten Chen Pao, but Urshifu's ability Unseen Fist removes a whole level of counterplay in Bypassing Protect. Along with that, because Surging Strikes always crits and hits multiple times, it bypasses Sturdy, Focus Sash, Screens, Defense Boost, and Attack Drops. It's the most reliable damage you can deal in the game, and players recognize that Chen Pao cranked this damage up to 10. Believe me, there's a reason this duo went on to win the 2023 World Championships. But while Urshifu may be the Pokemon who is best known for being Chen Pao's partner at the moment, the list of great partners is too long to actually list. Entei, Rillaboom, Hisui and Arcanine, King Gambit, and so on. Great Pokemon become broken next to Chen Pao, but where Chi Yu and Chen Pao speed up the pace of the game, the next two Treasures of Ruin slow it down pretty significantly. Tinglu I think might actually be the most overtuned among this quartet. Not only does it have great bulk overall with a massive 155 HP, 125 defense, and 80 special defense spread, but it's got a decent attack stat at 110 and great moves including the combination of Fissure and Stomping Tantrum, which is very funny by the way. But it can hold an Assault Vest on top of all of this, meaning that it becomes one of the single most difficult Pokemon in the game to knock out, even without reliable recovery options. To explain just how much this dude slowed down the game, we reached a point in Regulation C where Pala Balance was the name of the game, and people like to joke around that who won depended entirely on how long your Pokemon was put to sleep. This team was basically just Palafin for kill, Iron Hands for kill, Amoongus for life, and Ting Lu for AoE Assault Vest. Because Ting Lu effectively granted everything on the field in Assault Vest, it had arguably as many reliable partners as Chen Pao did. Hell, they were usually the same partners. Iron Hands was 100% the best example of this, as Iron Hands was able to run the Assault Vest with Ting Lu on the field to effectively make it nearly unkillable on the special side of things, or it could have Ting Lu as a partner to act as an Assault Vest so it could run an item like the Clear Amulet and no longer care about Intimidate. And with Terra Fire, Iron Hands also didn't have to worry about burns, so there wasn't really a way to lower that thing's damage output. Really, the great number of physical attackers in Generation 9 made Ting Lu a really reliable option for many seasons. It only really fell off for a short time in Regulation F before it came back as a great partner for Kamoa teams, which mainly focused on setting up defense boosts and just not dying and then spamming body press, so that special defense boost from Ting Lu is especially helpful there. Also, this really handsome guy named Marcos got 18th at Knoxville Regionals by pairing it with Gouging Fire, since Gouging Fire could boost on Pokemon with Dragon Dance and score massive damage while further reducing the damage to the opposing team by using Breaking Swipe. Good job, Marcos. You're still, you're, you're very handsome. Very, very good guy. You guys should subscribe to his channel. As much as I'd like to say that Wo Chen had a similar track record as Ting Lu, slowing the game down to a snail's pace and winning matches left and right, that would be yet another delusion I have about this Pokemon. The truth is that Wo Chen, for the longest time, wasn't able to accomplish much. This is not only because of its poor grass dark typing, which is really bad defensively, but because in Generation 9, physical attackers are definitely the name of the game. And having Wo Chen hinder their attack stats to help them live just a little longer is difficult to use without sabotaging your own team in some capacity. If you want your Urshifu to hit hard, that Wo Chen needs to leave the field ASAP. Along with that, Wo Chen has to compete with other grass types for a slot on the team. This means it's even harder to justify running on most teams, as you have to consciously choose to run it over Rillaboom and Amoongus, two very strong reliable grass types which don't have nearly the same number of drawbacks as running Wo Chen does. 
I was of the opinion for the longest time that Wo Chen is a very powerful tool, but it just didn't have the right Pokemon available to it as partners or the right Pokemon relevant in the metagame to be useful enough to run. This theory was proven correct by Joseph Ugarte, who top cut the 2023 World Championships where he used Wo Chen for a very particular reason. Remember when I said that Pokemon with Inner Focus and Urshifu don't really care about Intimidate drops? Well, as it turns out, Wo Chen can effectively serve as a pseudo Intimidate to these strong physical attackers. Normally, Urshifu Rapid Strikes clicking Surging Strikes can't really have its damage reduced as crits bypass Intimidate screens and defense boosts, but Wo Chen's Tablets of Ruins aren't actually a stat drop in the normal sense. It just applies a multiplier to the raw attack set of the Pokemon, meaning that it's one of the few ways you can negate some of the damage coming from these physical attackers. Joe used Wo Chen alongside Fluttermane and Thunderous Incarnate to spam powerful special attacks while being able to survive physical hits with these Pokemon that they really shouldn't be able to normally. He even ran Giga Drain to snipe Urshifu Rapid Strike and deal massive damage while healing Wo Chen for tons of health. This was the first time Wo Chen had a breakup performance, but sadly it would be a while before it had the next one. At the 2024 North American International Championships, nearly a year later, Restricted Legends were made legal for competitive play. This meant that a new pool of Pokemon with much higher damage output would become the center of the metagame. Along with that, there would be more special attackers for Wo Chen to be partnered next to. Two Wo Chen teams managed to have a strong performance at this event. The first of them was piloted by Shi Liang Tang and Justin Tang. This team used Assault Vest Kyogre alongside Wo Chen and Grimmsnarl to reduce the damage Kyogre would take and allowing for it to stay on the field longer and use its powerful rain boosted water type moves. The other was a similar team piloted by that handsome Marcos guy from Knoxville Regionals, only his team had Farigraph as a Trick Room option over the Grimmsnarl, and instead of Iron Jugulus, he ran a Tornadus. They were actually pretty different teams, but by complete coincidence, they stumbled upon the same tech that made Wo Chen the call for the tournament. You see, Assault Vest Kyogre has a great matchup into many of the strong attackers in the format, like Calyrex Shadow Rider, as its already high special defense stat was further bolstered by the Assault Vest, which would allow it to tank special attacks like nothing. However, its physical defense was a lot more exploitable by the likes of Coradon and Calyrex Ice Rider, two restricted Pokemon who normally can't be intimidated due to using the Clear Amulet item. By running Wo Chen, Kyogre effectively had a physical Assault Vest active, but even stranger, the Wo Chen of both of these teams was faster than the Kyogre. You see, Kyogre's strongest move is Water Spout, a spread water type attack which maxes out at 150 base power only if the Kyogre is at full health and decreases in power as Kyogre's health decreases. For this reason, Kyogre always has to have some form of speed control whether it be Trick Room or Tailwind. Kyogre needs to move first to get this powerful attack off, and even then, it really can only get one or two full power water spouts off per game at most. With Wo Chen on these teams outspeeding the partner Kyogre, not only could it decrease the incoming damage from physical attacks to keep that water spout powerful, but it could even heal Kyogre with Pollen Puff before the water spout happened to get it back up to full power and nuking the other side of the field. While Justin Tang and Marcus Press would ultimately day two the international championships and finish in top 64, Shi Liang managed to make it all the way to fifth place, granting Wo Chen yet another top cut at a major event. The Treasures of Ruin all have had their achievements, some more than the rest, obviously, but their very existence enables so many Pokemon and archetypes that it feels as though a door has been opened that can't really be closed. The depth of play and damage achievable by these Pokemon being in the game is something that will be difficult to top. It's reminiscent of when the Guardian Deities from Alola were created. These Pokemon dominated their metagame so much in Generation 7 that you never really even saw the battlefield. It was always covered by one of their terrains. These Pokemon feel much the same in that it's difficult to think of a matchup where you don't need to account for one of their abilities being active. And once they're not available in Generation 10 or some other format, we'll have to eagerly await for that door to once again be opened and for these Pokemon to change the game all over again. I'm not sure exactly what group of legendary abilities will change the game in the same way these ones have, but it feels as though we've peaked when it comes to these sort of things. I mean, the Loyal 3 certainly didn't raise the bar. But let me know what you think about these Pokemon in the comment section down below. Do you like them existing in the game, or do you much prefer competition before they were available? Let me know. And also let me know what videos you want to see next, what sort of topics I should cover. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, it would mean the world to me. And if you want to support me further, you can check out my Patreon page or become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button below the video. This gets you sneak peeks at future videos and even some bonus content. You'll also see your name at the end of my videos like all these lovely people. Special thanks to my most boosted supporters, Avatar67, Jordan, Harridge, and Ranger Lance for their generous pledges. Another way to support me is to check out all the videos in the playlist on screen right now. I know you'll find something in there that you'll enjoy. Also, I have a second channel where I talk about the current VGC metagame trends, and a Twitch channel where I stream, both of which are going to be in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.